Welcome to the Ask a Cycling Coach podcast presented by Trainer Road. Today, we are going to cover learnings from two athletes that are with us that race world championship races, two different ones, and how they can make you faster. We're going to cover which rides ruin your fitness. That's going to be a big topic to talk about. And then we're also going to talk about racing versus training. Why sometimes you can't replicate the numbers in a race that you do in training, vice versa. Lots of good stuff. So before we go any further, I want to say good job to all the athletes that raced Kona that used trainer road to make it happen. Uh, incredible and good job to all the athletes, even if you didn't use trainer road to make it happen. And also special shout out for us, a Reno athlete won the women's race. Absolutely amazing. Chelsea Sodaro. And she's mm -hmm. a mom of 18 months and she still managed to win Ironman world championships. Just absolutely incredible. Super cool. Uh, Spotify, if you're listening right now, do us a huge favor, go to Spotify. You can listen to the podcast there, but rate it. We are 100 ratings away from being the top rated cycling podcast on Spotify. So if we do that, that makes more people find this podcast. That makes more people sign up for trainer road. That makes us and they are enables us to build more features. So go do that. Cycling science explained. If you haven't watched the cryotherapy video, you're missing out. Go check it out. Uh, it's up on our YouTube channel. Uh, I dig into studies about whether cryotherapy, whole body, whole body cryotherapy actually makes you faster or not as a cyclist. And it's pretty interesting. So check that out. And also our science of getting faster podcasts. So check those things out. Uh, on our previous episode, we talked about kilojoules and calories, and there were about 12 people that wrote in, which means that we probably had 1200 people that were confused by it. Uh, but 12 people that wrote in that said, you did all your math wrong. Kilojoules and calories are not the same. Well, they actually are when you're on the bike, check it out. There's an article that we have trainerroad.com slash blog. And we break down why, uh, due to your, I believe it's thermogenic efficiency, roughly about 75% of your energy consumption just goes to managing heat, leaving a remaining 25% to push the pedals. Thusly, when you break down the one to four now it becomes one to one. So uh, that's a terrible explanation of it. And don't ask me to explain it uh, fully because I'll wrap myself in a pretzel. So, but go check it out. It's a fantastic <laughs> article that will help you understand why your kilojoules actually are the amount of calories that you burn and calories, capital C calories uh, that you burn on the bike. Cows. <laughs> K-Cows, exactly. Yeah. Uh, it gets super confusing, right, Alex? You're a food uh, measurer. But yes, <laughs> I think... Uh... The efficiency thing is hard to get around, but it's just because on, like you said, on the bike, essentially one in every four K cows goes to, sorry, three in every four K cows goes to managing heat. So you only get to use one for actually turning the pedals. So essentially for a cyclist, you can use them as one in the same, but that's the biggest differentiation is people confuse calorie with a capital C and calorie with a lowercase C. So I just, I stick to K cows because that's an easier way to explain it. True story. Yeah. And that's, of course, we have Ice Friction and Specialized Alex Wiles. Uh, we also have Keegan Swenson from Santa Cruz Hit Squad. What's up, Keegan? Hey, guys. <laughs> and then we also have Squid Bikes Ivy Andre. Hey. <laughs> hey. Hey. <laughs> Ivy is a woman of few words today. This is going to be fantastic. Sorry. <laughs> uh, we're going to get into Ivy's cyclocross season, uh, and we're also going to get into world champs. So, Ivy, first things first. Oh yeah, there are some guys that race world champs, but let me tell you about my single speed cross race. <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> but no, oh, I want to hear what you're learning because you mentioned a few weeks ago on the podcast that you were sick and you came in with really low expectations uh, that were appropriately set, right? Because you're just like, I just don't have like the fitness to be able to race where I was planning to race. So I'm just going to go into these races and accumulate experience and, and sharpen some other skills. How has it been going and what have you been learning? Uh, it's funny what that did to me when I lowered my expectations, because I feel like I've physiologically caught up, you know, when you think about like decay rate of your fitness, like there's, I really didn't, um, lose that much overall fitness by not feeling good for a few weeks, um, or a couple weeks. Um, sure. I wasn't able to perform the way that I normally could, but in the grand scheme of like the work that I had done prior can't really lose that much over a short duration of time like that. Um, but it was funny that, uh, once my body kind of caught up my mindset, like still kind of hasn't like something mm. happens to you when you go into a race being like, uh, okay, like I'll just see what happens. I'm going to work on these little things and not really trying to race 
hard for a result versus like really feeling like you're on the offense. And I still haven't been able to, it was kind of a bummer to like at the end of that block and try cup to feel like I was physically feeling better, but like mentally wasn't able to figure out how to decide to race hard again, or kind of like believe that I was better. Um, I just like, didn't have enough time to mentally make that switch or wasn't, didn't have the means to do so. Um, so I still kind of was racing on the back foot, which was a bummer until the single speed race, which was like, maybe really good for me. Um, maybe a good step in remembering how to race aggressively. It was awesome. Awesome. Rad. Yeah. Yeah. You won, uh, by the way, go to Ivy's Instagram, Ivy Audrain. You can find her on there. And go like the photo. It's fantastic stuff. Uh, Alex you. does, or or Keegan, the, does that resonate with any of you guys? Where you're trying, like, like the the mentality doesn't match the fitness. Yeah, I mean, I think for me, it's kind of how long <laughs> since I had, I guess, a breakthrough workout, which can be counterintuitive because taper is normally it's just super chill. So it's like, I think for me, the confidence comes from like nailing something like that. So it's like, if it's been too long since I've done like a big workout or something that I could be, I guess, proud of or whatever, then going into races more difficult than like normally when you kind of like charge into it and like everything's going perfect, you're checking boxes. I think it can be easier. So definitely a skill to be able to just understand, like, I mean, even if you did two weeks of nothing before the race. Like Ivy said, you're not really losing that much fitness. It's just not what you're used to. So I think it's kind of mm-hmm. rolling with the punches and, and being more flexible and, and you can still really like get really good results when things don't go well. And I think that's the hardest thing for us to like understand because it's so much like do two hours here, do three hours here, do these intervals. Like, so when you lose that, I think you lose a sense of control and then that kind of affects race. Mm. Keegan, anything about that resonate with you? Any thoughts? Yeah, um, I think I'd agree agree with Alex. It's kind of like just managing expectations, and sometimes you have to just like even if you're if the workouts aren't going well, you still can have a good race. You just need to you know put it in the past and race as if you're fine. That's normally what I do. You just try and fake it, and if it works out, it works out. If not, then it doesn't. I think if you go into a race thinking that you're not going to do well and like just having like, for me, just having, Oh, I'm just going to try and make it to here, make it to there. It doesn't, doesn't really work. I feel like I just have to go all in every time. And if, you know, sometimes you blow up, sometimes you don't. So it's like kind of two different mentalities, I guess. And it also depends on the race, right? Like sometimes you don't want to like lead people on to the fact that you're not feeling good or that you're sick or whatever. So you have to like race a bit of a different way. Um, but yeah, I think it's hard to, it's not, not an easy one to manage, you know? Um, mm-hmm. yeah. Ivy, I feel like, uh, now that you've gotten that single speed win down, like you said, is good for you to like rebuild the confidence <laughs> and stuff. Mm-hmm. I bet that that's going to, even though you're going to go back to racing geared bikes and it's like different, I guarantee you, like I've, I, knowing you, that's just going to gas you up, you know, yeah. you'll be ready to go. It will. And as someone that likes to race not necessarily for the results but because i like racing hard and being challenged um i think that's why i've been in the sport so long without you know accumulating a ton of uh on paper success like i like that process but it felt so bad to feel to not have like process goals in the race because i was so on the defense so i like that process of racing really hard but i didn't feel like i had anything to like come away with because i wasn't going through this process of be like, of being like, where are my strengths in this course? Where do I need to be conservative? Like how hard can I ride this section? Um, you know, I didn't like have any way to measure what riding hard looked like other than just being like, I'm going to try to survive. We'll see what happens. And that's why it kind of felt bad. So even doing that like silly little single speed race and like, you know, single speed so tricky and that you have to really think about, uh, <laughs> where the places are to run and where to like muscle it out and keep riding and how to carry speed better. And even just going through that process and like thinking about how to win really, um, I think was a good first step in changing my mindset. So I'm excited to go race again. Nice. Awesome. Alex, you raced marathon mountain bike world championships over in Denmark. Uh, what did, what were your learnings from that experience that you had? 
flat courses are harder to move up on than climbing courses. <laughs> Especially well, last for year when we like did you. it. Yeah. <laughs> Last you know, year what I mean by that, by the way, I should clarify because some people might be like, what the heck do you mean by that? What I mean, Alex has a fantastic power to weight ratio. So when you're looking at climbs, that's really favorable for Alex. Yeah. Yeah. So last year it was in Elba and it started with a like eight minute climb. That was essentially just a wall. So it was kind of just survival of the fittest right off the start. Whereas this one was, I was hoping it was going to be a bit more open, but they ended up doing like like two right turns and then it was like a cycle cross section through a park. So essentially like all hundred riders start like single filing, probably like two, three minutes in. So wow. And then from there on it was kind of just not survival, but I think realizing that I wasn't gonna race at the front that day, which was a bummer, but always fun to jostle around with people in their flags and national kits. Um I think for me, it was trying to get some experience at those races because we have 2024 Marathon Worlds in the U.S. and Snowshoe coming up, so I'd like to do well there. So I think just kind of getting that start, but also just starting a World Championships gets you five UCI points. So if I decided to do some more UCI Marathon stuff next year, it would at least get me somewhere up the grid and kind of mm. give me a kickstart for that. So. Yeah, it was a good experience. I think Denmark is a huge cycling nation. We got to drive over the bridge that the tour went over and stuff. So as far as like an experience goes, that it was super awesome. And we got to go to Copenhagen and explore thereafter. So can't complain. Yeah. Did you, uh, your performance, like in terms of what you could measure, so your numbers, uh, was it where you expected it to be? Like you said, you realized that you weren't going to race at the front just because of the nature of the race in your start position but were your numbers where you expected them to be a little lower than what I'd say I'm capable of. I think, I think I've talked about it on the podcast before, but essentially since Tusher, I kind of hit a wall and had a dip and I've been kind of struggling to get back on it. And I don't think, I mean, until recently where I've been feeling really good, I didn't think I'd be able to come back to like, sea otter level performance until next year until i taken some time off and kind of fully reset um i think my it was just over four hours and the normalized was like 305 or so cool. but i think for something like that i could do closer to 320 or 330 especially because like that single, like just like single track sections in the corners and stuff was pretty punchy so they normalized would be like inflated a little bit from that Mm. So I think maybe missing the last like five to 10% just from fatigue. And I, I struggle to say overtrain, but I think I kind of jumped into the volume train too much and, uh, mm. kind of just went too big, too fast instead of kind of gradually growing year over year. So I think I'm yeah. paying for that a bit, but I mean, in the long run, I think it'll be a benefit. I just, the body can't reap the rewards just yet. Have y'all noticed that, uh, like, uh, Keegan Ivy, how like there's, cause you measure training stress. It's all relative, right? Like what you're doing now based on what you've been doing recently, but also it's, you can look at that at different time scales. It's like weekly TSS, monthly TSS, a whole training block, a whole year of training, like multiple years of training. And I feel like when you really ramp like Alex, you've mentioned on the podcast, how much you've ramped up the volume this year. So if you're to look at this year versus, because typically with TSS, you know, you're looking at like a six week average. So current week versus six week sort of thing. When you're looking at a lot of different charts with training stress. So when you look at that, if you're to look at this year versus the previous six years, oh, I have you're through the <laughs> roof, right? Like, like it's a huge amount of stress that your body's been tolerating for a large time period here, uh, throughout the, the year. So it, it kind of makes sense that your body would be like, uh, needing some time to be able to absorb all of this work, uh, because it just, you know, chronically adds up and then, you know, it causes fatigue. So it makes sense. Yeah. To put it in perspective, when I measured it, I think it was like a month or two ago, I was 30% up in terms of hours on the bike from last year to this year. It's huge uh, increase. I'm, I'm closer <laughs> to 25 now because we've been chilling out. <laughs> But, uh, do you quit your job? Like what? <laughs> How many? <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. It's crazy. He rides at night. So just picked up another <laughs> job. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Keegan, what did you learn at Road Worlds? We talked about this on the podcast. I appeared like uh, clairvoyant, although I must say I didn't have any sort of like insight is honestly kind of easy to like put the dots together that to consider that you might be selected for this, you know, but um, mm -hmm. so we talked about it beforehand, but what did you learn? Yeah. I mean, it was definitely, uh, it was a bit of a last minute thing, you know, as everyone kind of knows, like I didn't really, I didn't find out I was going until about two weeks before. And so we kind of had to do a quick, quick pivot. I mean, I was training for Schwam again and just to try and, you know, wrap up the, the Grand Prix there. And then this came about and I was like, well, I guess we're just going to pack in like a, you know, see if we can get like seven, 10 days of volume in and kind of, kind of train through Schwam again and then head on straight to Australia. And I think, uh, I don't think I was quite at my very best, but I was pretty close. I think, I think we had kind of like build a ramp it back up and, um, I felt pretty good, but yeah, I think, uh, man, there's a lot to, lot to uncover there. There was <laughs> just such a different, uh, mm -hmm. different kind of race. And I mean, I've done, done like, you know, a fair bit of, obviously my fair bit of gravel racing and a bit of road racing here and there, but, uh, this was just such a different experience. Uh, like the race itself, like overall wasn't, I like, it was hard, but it was a different kind of hard. It wasn't ever like, it was very on and off. Like when it was on, it was really on. Like I set a new 10 minute PR for the season, which was pretty wow. solid considering like Cape at big had some pretty full gas, 10 minute sections and, um, other races I've done, have had some hard 10 minute climbs. So like that goes to show it was pretty hard. Um, and then there was also like, you know, I spent like almost 50 minutes in zone six over, you know, six and a half hour <laughs> race. So like, <laughs> it was like when it was on, it was like, you know, full gas, which I wasn't really prepared for. I think I was like, I kind of knew it might be that way, but in my mind, I was like, Oh, it's going to be a six and a half hour race. Like it'll, there'll be a fair bit of time, like, you know, tempo, sweet spot, whatever. And there was some time there. Like, there were some times when you're sitting in the draft doing tempo and you're like, wow, this is, this is fast. Like, we're motoring right now, you know? Um, yeah, for me, the biggest part was I struggled with positioning, um, and I was doing pretty well with it early on in the race. And I think when the speed increased on the circuits, it got even harder to do, to manage positioning well with, without burning a bunch of energy to get back to the front. Um, so I came into the circuits, was in a pretty good spot. I was able to like manage that pretty well. And then I was like, I should just like kind of chill out a little bit and float towards the back. And then it turned up with like three or four laps left, which is still, I mean, it's 17 K per lap. So it was pretty long, still long, quite a while, while left. And, um, yeah, I found myself in the back and then I'd get to the front and then all of a sudden I'd be back at the back again. And then we go into the climb and going into the climb, like you're kind of stuck, right? Like the road is packed, like side, side, full, like left to right. There's no, you can like kind of weasel your way through a little bit, but it's hard to really launch through. And it, the climb would like up flatten out and there's one more kick and it was about two minutes. So Every time I get up over the first pitch being in the back, I'd see that like, oh, oh, dang, this group is splitting. So I'd have to like ride across to the next group. And that would kind of happen. That kind of happened over and over the last few laps. And mm -hmm. uh, then I started to crack. And then with two to go, um, I guess going into the last lap. So on two to go, the, that happened. I, I just couldn't make it across. I was like two bike lengths from making it to that front group again and just couldn't do it. Um, and, you know, like I'm going wide open, the guys ahead of me are going full gas and they're some of the best in the world. So like, you just can't, it just not, it was, wasn't going to happen. Um, and you just spent the prior two laps closing gaps the entire time. Sorry. Yeah. That became a bit <laughs> of an issue. And I knew yeah. I had to get there and it was hard. Cause like mentally I'm like, I know I have to get to the front of this group, but I was already like kind of on the edge of like cracking. So I'm like, I can either try and do it on the flats where it takes relatively more energy. Like I can do 500 Watts and roll up the side or I can try and weasel my way through the bunch. And then maybe like, I just figured in my, in my mind, it made more sense to like try and use my Watts per kilo to move up. But I think, mm -hmm. you know, and I like, you can only, I can only get so far through the bunch before I get to the climb again. And it was like, I don't know, I was, I try and follow guys who I thought were good going through the bunch. I'd be able to move a few turns up and maybe I like made it a third of the way through, but then, yeah, then we get there and I'm like, ah, oh, this is going to happen again. I know it is. And then, the same thing would happen. I just felt like I was stuck in this, stuck in this hole. So I think in hindsight, I mean, it would have been good to like fully chill out 
earlier in the circuits and then just get to the front and stay there. Cause once I was there, I could, I could hold position pretty well, mm -hmm. but it was so hard to move through the bunch when the race was already on and the pace was full gas. Those last four laps, like even on the flats and whatnot, cause the chase was on, there was no, there was no way I was going to move up the side without doing more than 500 Watts to go up, up the group. So it was like, Sheesh. yeah, it was brutal in the feed zones. The feed zone we were, the main feed zone we were feeding out of was on the first little climb that was in the time trial course. So a few laps, you're like, well, I can just not feed this lap and I'll just roll up the left side and you can, you can, you know, roll through the entire bunch right there. But if you needed a bottle, then you're trying to fight to get back to the right. And then, yeah, so it was just like really aggressive. And, you know, if you're not, if there's a small gap, then someone's going to fill it. And it was like, I mean, the best way I can explain it, it was like, in my mind, it felt like the first lap of the world cup for like six hours. So it was like <laughs> pretty, pretty stressful, you know, like, <laughs> I think that was also a big part of the reason I kind of cracked at the end is I was like mentally like really stressed the whole time. I never, I never was relaxed. You know, I was always kind of gripped. Yeah. It's a totally um, new environment. Yeah. Like I started to figure it out, but even then like I was feeling more comfortable, but I was still more stressed. Like my heart rate's higher. I'm holding the bars tight. Like I was always just waiting for someone to take my front wheel away. Like it was always, I was just always on the edge of like mental, mentally having kind of a hard time, you know, or if that yeah. bottle you're looking for was on the floor in front of you. Yeah, yeah. Like there was some of that, like I got my front wheel taken a few times and had like, it was, a little, you know, there was a lot of close calls and, you know, saw some guys get laid out and, and that's just the way it is. And I feel like the world is always extra hard that way too, especially being in this circuit, like the climb was only two minutes and the course was like, there were some open roads, some open boulevard sections, but there was also some like really tight pinches where we go through a parking lot and there was like, yeah. So it was, I think it was harder than most, even most one day regular races. Do you feel like, feel like, like yeah, go on. Do you feel like the dynamic would have been different in that regard if it was a more like spread out course, if there was like a longer featured climb or something like that? Oh, for sure. Yeah, I think yeah. the race would have been a fair bit different if even if we had done circuits on that Kira climb, we only did one lap up Kira, which was the 10 minute, I guess it was mm -hmm. like a 15 minute climb. And then we went into the circuits. So we'd only done, we went into the circuits with only like maybe two hours of racing. So we still had four and a half hours left on these circuits. So had we done like a few laps of Kira up the 10 minute climb, I think it would have made everyone a bit softer. Um, and maybe the group, they also, the group would have been smaller even going up here at one time, we got rid of like probably a quarter of the bunch was gone and they never came back, you know, cause that climb was wide open. So I think, mm -hmm. um, and then it stayed on into the circuit. So I don't mean maybe if you guys were to claw their way back on, but I, I think we lost quite a few, like their race was where the race was over, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, so if we'd done that a few times, I think it would have been, it would have been a completely different race. Uh, and like, we weren't sure also like going into Kier, like it was only 45 minutes into the race. And we're like, I don't know if it was going to be hard or not. Um, so luckily I was had, like, we had, we were told to be somewhat near the front cause the race could go there. And luckily it was, I was there cause if I was in the back. It would have been really hard. <laughs> yeah. Cause you made that selection that happened there on that, that climb. Yeah. Um, I was definitely like kind of one of the last ones to make it. I had kind of hesitated for a second. Um, Cause I wasn't sure if it was going to be, and then I was like, saw some of the big names rolling up. I was like, I need to, need to get in this group. So yeah, it was definitely kind of right out of my skin for a few minutes, but you know, kind of had to. <laughs> Those circuits yeah. looked really, really hard just because there was never any rest and there was lots of road furniture between roundabouts, yeah. turns, narrow little bending sections that were made more complicated by road furniture and like undulations. It was it just never, like you never had a moment. The only time that you kind of had to be off, it looked like was not once the descent started, but like during a portion of the descent, there was a straight section before you went into a big right-hander. It was mm -hmm. like, I think that was the only spot that I saw really where you could actually recollect and kind of take a break. Yeah. And there was that big boulevard section, like that was maybe three K to go before the finish. Mm -hmm. That was nice and wide. Before but even that then climb. some, yeah, but even then some laps, it was like full gas and just strung out through there. So just kind of depended. Um, I definitely felt more comfortable in the bunch when it was a bit harder because there was less, like, it was like less tight, you know, like people are not trying to move forward as much because it's harder. So it's, I felt it was a little more relaxed when it was going fast. Um, yeah. but yeah, it was definitely was, it was kind of hard to find the right places to move up. And then by the time I feel like I had it figured out, it was kind of too late, you know? <laughs> <laughs> 
Alex, I, I spoke over you. I apologize. You're going to say something. No, I was just going to ask if you noticed the U.S. historically doesn't have the same team size as some of those big powerhouses like Belgium. And so I feel, and and we normally do like a different approach where like kind of everybody goes in a different break or not mm-hmm. everybody for themselves, but more just trying to cover the moves as best they can. And I wonder if in a race like that, do you think it would have been better if we're able to, to kind of send like a one pronged approach or a two pronged approach and, and have more support riders in a race like that? Cause you're talking about moving up. And I imagine if right. you kind of had like a road captain or something like that to kind of tell you where you need to be, but also get you where you need to be. And kind of like, it's one of those rare racers that you don't have radio. So having someone on the road, that's like, you're telling me what to do. You're telling me where to be. You're getting me there. You're getting my bottles, like stuff like that. Like how much of a difference do you think that makes? Yeah. I mean, I did notice that like the, the countries ahead teams that made it so easy, like they would just roll through the bunch and like, they'd just, you know, flick you off or whatever. And you'd, it made it hard to, cause there's only, there's a few countries that had these really like few nations had really big teams. They had like eight or nine riders. Cause I think the biggest team was eight riders, but then if you're the world champion, you, you addition, get it automatic. Yeah. So like, I think France had nine riders. Um, it's so like France, Belgium, um, Netherlands, Australia, Great Britain. These countries had pretty good sized teams and they were definitely racing as a team for one rider. They were controlling um, it for sure too. They like were controlling the that. race. And <clears throat> mm-hmm. so they, that also made it a bit difficult because there's, and then there's a bunch of nations like us that had smaller teams um and like they're kind of working together you know like it but it's also hard like i really didn't know like i, I would try and follow nelson or magnus through the bunch and um like kind of listen to that we just told them i was like just tell me what to do like just yell at me because I, I don't really know i'm not you know not fully know what i'm doing and for a lot <laughs> of times like i, I mean i could help if i needed to but a lot, like for the most part i was just trying to survive you know and that was you know kind of kind of the job um so yeah i think like having a full team would definitely be helpful because I think it's like, you can just take control of the race a bit more and um, it's easier to get riders through to the front too. Cause then they'd have a rider just like roll up the side on the, when it was wide and just like get their front, like get yeah. their guys who need to be there, there. And then the ride, then those guys would just chill and then they do it again later. And so I know, I noticed that a fair bit and like you try and get on the back of their train and move up when you could or whatnot. But yeah. It was definitely a, a different dynamic with between the smaller countries that only had you know four or five riders and then the countries that had these big teams that were fully dedicated to working for one or two riders so that was super interesting at marathon worlds because we started to see that because it was such a flat course i think two of the danish riders finney and um and we got third simon and Jason. yeah simon and yeah, so awesome. They both started like mid pack because they're XC guys. So they're behind mm-hmm. all the guys that have marathon. I think by the how fast they got to the front, Denmark actually entered riders whose sole goal was to get them from their hundredth startup spot to the front group. It was yeah, and those guys are also so good at moving through the bunch. Um yeah. mm-hmm. like I mean, I've raced with both those guys for a long time and they're really good at moving through a pack like that at the start. Um so like at World yeah. Cups, like we would both be starting in the sixties for like me and Feeney and he would make it to the front way quicker than I'd be able to. I think, yeah. So I think probably a combination of both. I mean, they had, it was they probably had riders curious. dedicated. Yeah. yeah. No, I was just but, curious uh, to see him yeah. versus like Vlad came out as well. And I think yeah. he was the only one from Romania and he finished like two or three spots in front of me at the end. So it's like, mm-hmm. like you said, it's, there's a lot of those just quick, decisions where it's like i'm gonna go left here which can actually like make it yeah, i'm like making the front spots, group or you know? yeah or yeah. i'm or i'm back in 80th mm-hmm. now just from like that one decision and you, and it's a gut call right it could go either way like right could have been the perfect call so yeah you just don't know and then marathon worlds it's crazy in terms of team size because you i think you get 10 riders off the bat and then if you have 10 riders in the top 40 and then if you have the outgoing world champion you can have a team size of 21 people at marathon world championships mm-hmm. wow and like 21. most races it like most country most marathon worlds it's not really gonna matter but this one yeah. was like one of the fastest flatter ones and that yeah, was bonkers um, and i yeah. think like the way we were seeing it is just like it seemed like czech republic france and denmark had that because we would see riders coming off the front group who are just soft pedaling like their their goal for the entire day was just to drive that group for like an hour mm-hmm. it mm-hmm. was bonkers 
It was like yeah. a road race on mountain bikes. Yeah. Well, nice. Keegan, cool. I love your um approach of uh instead of you know, just being like, Yeah, I'll survive, I I'll do my best instead of being like, just yell at me, tell me what to do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I love that so much. Because I was like, you know, I don't I, mean, I kinda know what I'm doing. Like I think I'm a pretty good bike racer, but this isn't like anything I've ever done. So I was like, if you see me doing something stupid, just tell me. Like <laughs> no, feel free that. to yell at me, you know, like <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah, great. good on you. Growth mindset. Yeah, that's the exactly. spot to be. Uh, so we're going to move on from these world championship events to something that's much less important <laughs> and significant, but it's a fun one to talk about. There's a, uh, have you guys heard of Red Bull Bay Climb? Uh, yeah. I, it's, mm -hmm. it's one of, it's always been interesting to me. San Francisco is really close to Reno. It's not far away. It's like, a, I don't know, like three and a half hour drive or something. And I'm there. Uh, I'm going to do it. I'm not fit. I'm heavy. Uh, and this one, the, yeah, for those that don't on. know, Hey, it's a be point. nice to yourself. <laughs> oh, no, no, I'm, I'm not fit <laughs> and I'm heavy. Like those are just facts. It's not being nice or mean. It's just facts. Um, 0.32 miles and it's, uh, average grade of 12.6%, but a peak of 20.6. And the reason that it only averages 12 is because it has three flat intersect intersections in it. Uh, it's typical San Francisco city hill climb. Um, say, anyways, if anybody's seen San Francisco in the movies, he's literally going up one of those steep things across the flat and then doing that three times. <laughs> yes, exactly. And I think it's one of the steeper ones in the city. I'm not sure, but, uh, yeah, it's, I've heard it's pretty bonkers. I've never been out there. I know, um, Payson did it one year and he uh -huh. said it was pretty hard. Like he was setting one minute PBs. Yeah. Cause it's, it's just like, like that kind of race. For really fast guys, they tend to do it somewhere around like 70 seconds, I think. Uh, for me, it will not be 70 seconds. I think I got to work toward that 90 second power. Um, but uh, it's going to be a good time. I'm stoked to do it. I tried to talk uh, the rest of the crew here into doing it, but I don't think it's going to happen with them. But if you're going to go and do that one, check it out. It'll be good fun. You can check out Jeff Linder from NorCal Cycling. He's done some videos on it. He did it fixed gear last year. And then uh, prior to that, he had done it Yikes. not fixed, just with geared bikes. Um but I also know of some people that are going this year and there's going to be PRs set. So I think we're going to have the fastest time up it. You're going to set up a Franken bike. That's the big question. I always thought like a road bike, but with like wide bars that you can really leverage would be sick. Like an Athos with a like 760 flat bar on it or something. Yeah, probably but, faster because arrow doesn't really matter in this case. Like, no, just like how much leverage, like you're standing almost the entire time. Yeah. And that's what I'm planning on too. Like, that's why uh, I'm going to use trainer road outside workouts and I'm going to do, if you go onto our YouTube channel, we did a cycling science explained video on sprint training. And there's this whole concept that you can use sprint training to get like aerobic endurance, but also it can help you be a better sprinter. There's a really good video on it. So check it out on our YouTube channel. Um, but I'm going to employ that, but it's all going to be standing work because like, you're not going to sit if you're going full gas for 60 seconds ish, you know, 60 to 90 seconds. There's no point in yeah. sitting. I feel like the way I train for it is almost like doing 30 30s but completely different like i would do like 25 fives but like the fives aren't like recovery because you want to go up the steep part and then you want to like maintain your momentum along the flat but like try to take like the slightest bit of rest and bring the momentum into the next one and then do that three times yeah yeah one minute efforts are really hard. I've never really trained them you know with like cycling we tend to train like 30 seconds even 45 seconds but then it tends to be like two to three minutes, you know, like VO2. That last 15 seconds, like if you it's do an all miserable. out one minute effort, like my arms hurt at the end. Like I feel like yeah. I like, like, <laughs> yeah, like you just have to like drape yourself up at the butt. Like it's, it just empties you. If you go full gas for a minute, like trying to get a PB, like yeah. I almost feel like I got to get off the bike. Like <laughs> this isn't, insane. it's weird. <laughs> it drains, like it, it pulls on all the energy systems and drains them all real fast. Like it's kind of a weird duration for that. I actually experienced for the first time. So Nate asked this on the podcast a long time ago. I had never experienced it. And he told me I hadn't gone hard enough, but arms going numb from going really hard. And I had experienced that with running and I like during my track workouts and it's like really hard hundreds or something like that. And you're repeating those. Yes. Like I do get that, but I got that for the first time yesterday. I went and did, I was like, well, I want to see where my one minute power is. So and it was 630 Watts for a minute. But I think I've got a lot more than that in the tank. And I'm going to see if two weeks of training, I can pull that out <laughs> somehow. So right, I guess weeks. the 500 watt number on your Instagram. Don't be mad. <laughs> uh, yo, you have little faith, Alex. Um, let's go into Jack's question. He says, 
And this is really for uh, you all also for coach Chad, who's not here today. We'll be here next week, but also chimed in for this on this question for us. He says, thanks for the podcast and an amazing product. I've been using trainer road now for several years and it's helped me prepare for multiple events. <clears throat> it's just so easy to use, especially now with adaptive training. And that has certainly made me faster. Go to trainerroad.com and sign up right now. Have your best season yet with adaptive training. It says on the weekend, I completed a 70.3 triathlon and was very happy with the result. However, in the days since I've had cause to rethink at the event and wonder if I left something out there on the course. Whilst I have been doing endurance events for over 20 years now, I still don't think I have a pacing strategy fully nailed. My question for the team though, is about how to do a proper post race review. I'm looking for a process to use to critically review my data and understand where I could have pushed harder or maybe needed to back off. I'd be interested in all of your thoughts on this, but would also be interested in how coach Chad approaches this with the athletes he's trained over the years. And I got his, his answer to that one. So we'll read that first, then go into how these athletes review some stats in this case for Jack, <clears throat> Jack is 67 kilograms. So what that's somewhere around like 145 ish pounds, um, with an FTP currently. Yeah. Somewhere around there. Uh, with an FTP currently at 270 Watts, max HR of 165 BPM. Uh, on Sunday did a five thirteen. uh, overall that's for the half. So a 37 minute swim two forty five on the bike and then, uh, one thirty nine run. So not too bad, not too shabby, Jack. Well done. Anyways, uh, let's hear from Chad first and then we'll go from there. Chad said <clears throat> with my athletes, our retrospectives always consisted of a comparison between what was expected and then compared to what was actually delivered on the race day. The comparisons included what should be possible if each event were run individually. For example, what is your current optimal half marathon pace, 40 KTT pace and current 1500 meter open water swim time. Uh, what time would be possible when all of those events are stacked to end to end? Usually we'd figure that out via brick workouts because the swims impact on the rest of the race was seldom a deep concern <clears throat> unless you're like me. And then you uh, go through a traumatic experience when you get into water and then it has a profound effect, Chad. So uh, these comparisons were then weighed against race day subjective observations. Like I felt great today, or I struggled in the heat or had a full belly during the swim, or I was psyched out and, or too excited by the competition and objective race day power pace review in order to either confirm or refute that the actual matched the perceptual. For example, I felt like I was working harder than usual on the bike to maintain my target Watts. Running felt effortless midway through the run, so I reined myself in for fear of falling apart in the closing kilometers. But beyond that, pacing could only be viewed in broad strokes. In other words, getting up or getting hung up on pace fluctuations on a very course weren't very helpful while looking at overall bike or run paces. Uh, that, on the other hand, was just looking at the overall. Did I output more power than I expected on the bike only to find my race pace hampered? Did I hold back too much on the bike to find I was overly fresh on the run? Or did I finish the run with a kick so strong that it indicated I underpaced the run or maybe the bike? So Chad gave like some key indicators to know, which kind of sound like Jack, you're probably picking up on some of things, some of these, because you're like, eh, I think I could have gone harder. Um, let's start with Ivy. Ivy, how do you, like looking back at a race, do you have any indicators or things that you look at, like a process that you have to figure out if you indeed did give all that you could, or you went too hard? What's your process like? <clears throat> yeah. I mean, when thinking about comparisons and subjective observations, like Chad is talking about, I feel like, um, for myself, I can't make an observation about how the race felt, um, without having a plan first. Um, you know, it's mm. all relative if you don't know, um, like if I were to go do an XC race blind without a plan of like what I wanted to, in what ways I wanted to pace and how I wanted to like set up for each section of the course, I wouldn't know if I did well or, or poorly in comparison to, you know, how I should feel or what I wanted to feel if I didn't have any expectations going in. So I think having a plan is the best way for me to effectively reflect upon if I did it well or not. Ooh, really good point. Yeah. Awesome point. Alex, how about you? Uh, what's your process? <clears throat> what's your process like? Yeah, I think a lot of expectation versus reality. Um, I think reviewing certain sections in terms of like, like Keegan said on his worlds, like he knows he went out on that first climb and set a 10 minute PB. So like kind of taking those into consideration for the rest of the race. 
like in his case that was necessary to stay at the front group but it's like are you burning unnecessary matches i think is a thing in mountain bike racing like was there an easier way to get to the front was there a better way to save energy should i have been at the front at that certain time so just kind of even if you win or get the result you're looking for i think there's always room for opportunity in terms of like optimization and like even little things i think in mountain biking a lot of it's like am I pedaling out of the corners when I could be like flowing through a little faster or stuff like that. So essentially my goal is always, could I do the same performance for less power? Mm, I like that. Keegan, how about you? Yeah. Uh, I guess I agree with Alex a bit on that one. There's like kind of a lot you can, I mean, there's a lot you can do to, I mean, uh, yeah, there's a lot to unpack here. I feel like, <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. For me, I guess like I always analyze the race and be like, okay, did you execute your plan? And then, then you go back and say, was that plan actually good? Like, did it did it work? Whether you won the race or not, there's always stuff that you can do better. Whether that's fueling, whether that's like tactics. Maybe you just like, you know, maybe you should have like gone harder this time and done this different stuff. And I think, um, like for me, I try to analyze that fairly quickly after the race while everything's fresh and then you know not get like okay i did like pretty well here i did really well here this was perfect don't need to change this and just focus on the ones that you had the biggest errors mm -hmm. um for me this this year this was unbound i thought i mean immediately after the race i knew exactly what went wrong and like <laughs> what like what i could have done better and then from there, I went back through the entire race and be like, okay, maybe I could have done this better here to, to make myself fresher for this part. And so there's a lot you can, there's a lot you can unpack. And, um, but you also need to be like, you can't be super hard on yourself. Like you can be a little bit bummed, but also you'd be like, well, this is like, I did the best today with what I had. Um, mm -hmm. but I still think there's a lot you can learn. Um, and you just have to be like, just be like very, like, be thoughtful about it. Like, Oh, like make, make notes for, even if you have to, to like, Oh, I should run these tires, this pressure. And if it's, if it's a race, it's going to happen again, there's stuff you can do. And, um, yeah, it's a balance of like, uh, yeah, not being super hard on yourself at the same time, like being honest, but yeah, I just like straight up messed up here. And if I, would, if I would have done this, the result could have been different, not to say it would have been for sure, but like it likely would have changed or, um, yeah, I don't know. It's, a, mm -hmm. it's a, kind of tough, but there's always something you can learn. And I think whether it's training or nutrition or tactics, there's always like small bits you can improve. So, yeah. Putting rubber to road. So like taking all of your, because all of your suggestions are fantastic. Um, what I do is when I build out a plan, I'm really specific about what I want to accomplish in a race. Um, Keegan, you've mentioned this before in working with uh, Jim and Jim Miller on the episode that we did with Jim, where he sets specific objectives for his athletes in a lot of the races where it's like, you know, in cross country races, it would be like by the end of the start lap to be here by the end of this to be there. Mm -hmm. Ivy, you've mentioned that also with like cyclocross just to be like, you know, you know, by the end of lap one, I want to be in this spot. So having the plan in place, put that in place. And that gives you really easy things to check up on after the race kind of like Chad, it's really important to keep an eye on the big picture there. And if you met those objectives, but I also go deeper than that with the data and it's, but I keep it really simple. I know roughly what I should be able to maintain. Like, so for a cross country Olympic race, I know that I should be somewhere around like 90% of FTP north or above that in terms of my IF, right? Like 0.9 is like where I'll probably be at the end of a traditional XCO uh, race. It's going to be really hard, <clears throat> but somewhere around there is where I'll be. So I look at that and I say, okay, my power was lower or it was higher. Was that because of the course? <clears throat> was that because of the strategy of how it needed to be raced? Or was that because I didn't meet the objective and I could have otherwise? And if that's the case, then I go instantly to nutrition. I think what happened with nutrition during the race. And then I think of nutrition before the race and leading up to it. And then after that, then I'll look at sleep and, and like coming into it. Was I giving myself enough time to recover? And then I look back at the training. Was I doing too much leading into it? Uh, all those different things. And that's usually how I break down the power side of it on the bike. And But you can do the same thing with the run and with the swim as well. Um, so I use a blend of that. I basically have, okay, I check up on my pre-race objectives and I go back and I try to check those boxes. And if I can't check one of the boxes, then I figure out why. And I go through that kind of flow chart of, was it pacing? Was it nutrition? Or was it course? Was it pacing? Was it nutrition? Was it recovery? 
coming into it. And then that usually gets me to a spot where I have learnings that I can apply for the next one. But the tricky part about triathlon for a lot of athletes is they just don't do as many races, right? So like you have one, maybe three races that you do a year. And that gets kind of tough because then it's a long time in between those learnings and you don't get enough time to practice them. I think that's one thing for triathletes in particular, like, you know, good racers, that's a unique skill racing itself, like, and being able to execute as a racer, uh, Ivy, you're really good at that because of the style of racing that you've done, because you've got like these, this road career where you're just on the road, putting in a ton of race days and now cyclocross where it's tons of racing. I think that's a big benefit and something to be learned. This whole process gets easier as you race more. And if you're only doing one to three races a year, it's going to get tough to feel like, man, I really have my process down. I know how to analyze and learn. Right. Ivy. Yeah. And I think those things that you're mentioning about being able to look back and, and try to discern, was it nutrition? Was it my recovery leading into this? Those are really hard things to learn about yourself as an athlete that take a lot of time and practice in really isolating what's going on and where, what went wrong. And that's stuff you can practice in training too. You don't have to wait until race day to critically look at how did you set yourself up to do well at this? Like, look at that for key workouts. And when you have a really good workout and trying to figure out what went right, what did I do right? And then you'll have practice at identifying when things go wrong and really isolating what contributes to a good and a bad workout. Yeah. yeah. Well said. I also think, uh, like maybe it's a little bit off topic, but going like when you're planning out your strategy for a race, I think you need to leave like you can't have it be a super rigid plan because then if like something goes wrong early, it can just derail you for the entire event. So I almost think that like, yeah, be in first need to have your plan. Like, <laughs> yeah. Like, like it's just like not going to work, you know, like right. you gotta have the plan pretty loose and not set super high expectations and just have like kind of guidelines. And then in the end, I think you need to trust, like trust your instincts and trust your gut. That's one thing I've learned over the years is that like, if I think I should do something, I probably should do it. Whether it like it works in my plan or not. And maybe for some people that's wrong. Maybe you need to actually yeah. follow your plan more rigidly, but yeah, for me, I've found like, if I think I need to do something, I probably need to do it. Um, and I think, yeah, like just be loose with your plan. It just, cause like, just cause the first part of your plan doesn't work. Doesn't mean your whole race is trash. That means you just need to like refocus and make, okay, what's the next goal. We're going to focus on this. Or you can kind of have like two plans, like have like a plan A and plan B. If this one doesn't work, then we're going to default to this one and go into this strategy. So I think you should need to be kind of flexible and not let it derail you from the start. If like your swim goes bad in a triathlon, that doesn't mean your entire race is over. You still have two events left. And it's like, yeah. you know, you can, I mean, depends on who you are. <laughs> depends on how bad your swim is, but you still I mean, can, like, you know, it's like, Jamie, or if you have a bad start at a cross country yeah. race or a cross race, you still can have a good race, you know, like just cause you're yeah. starting last or like, just cause you got closed out in the first corner doesn't mean you still can't win. There's still like so much racing left. You just have to like maybe reevaluate and pivot and just be adaptable. So mm-hmm. and being as long able as you to don't recover drown. and <laughs> yeah, I was just going to say, when you get a bad start, you don't die. <laughs> so like, yeah. you know, it's yeah. a little different. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Ivy. Oh no. You just, you have to be able to mentally recover when that stuff happens. Right. Like, especially to start, you can't like fixate on, uh, like getting pushed out of that first turn or like if you miss a pedal or something, you can't just let it wreck you. You have to be able to bounce back mentally. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Great points. Uh, I feel okay, like you we're good. Collect oh, Alex, ex- please. I feel like you collect these experiences too. So I feel like from like a fueling point of view, like I can look at a course and be like, all right, here's where I can fuel on it. And you can make decisions on like liquid calories versus gels or whatever you like to do. And I think that helps a lot because I think the most common thing when you miss a fueling plan is like, oh, I either forgot to reach into my pocket or I just, the pace was so full gas, I couldn't eat. So I think you learn to look at a course and be like, all right, here's the fueling plan and here's how I can execute that. And I feel like for long distance stuff, fueling is probably the biggest thing that you can do right to make Mm -hmm. pacing easier. Yeah. Particularly in try just because once you get onto the run, if you haven't fueled properly up until that point, like the run is like the crucible, like it's going to, it's going to shake any weakness out of you with, uh, especially with nutrition, you know, you're either going to be in the porta potty or, or completely flat and out of gas. So you really have to make sure that you're doing it right. Stefan's question says, I'm riding my first ever cyclocross season and have completed the first two races of the season. And I found starts to be really hard and I lose a lot of ground. 
I pr primarily seem to lose places because I'm nervous around all the other riders and then I let gaps open up. Before you know it, I'm one of the last few riders into the first technical section on the course, and I have to put in a lot of work passing people for the rest of the race. So how can I improve my starts so I don't give myself such a disadvantage? P.S. I loved Ivy hosting a few weeks back. Looking forward to more of that. Us too. Ivy's hosting next week. It's going to be Thanks. fantastic. <laughs> um, uh, it's, yeah, Ivy, this is your wheelhouse. Uh, let's, what would you say in this yeah. case to Stefan on starts? Uh, that if I was starting in a beginner's level cyclocross race, I would be nervous too. It is <laughs> kind of <laughs> scary, <laughs> but it's their first ever cross season and they've done two races. Like it's okay. It's you shouldn't expect to be great at starts yet. Um, and if you feel like you're not great relative to the people that you're racing with, there's stuff you can work on. Like starting needs mm -hmm. to be practiced just like any other technical skill. Um, you know, just from getting in your pedal quickly right away to making sure you're in the right gear at the start, which is tricky because Alex and Keegan know this, like if you start in too easy of a gear, then in that first pedal stroke, if you, if it's too light of a gear, then you'll turn the pedals over too quickly and you can't find the other pedal and can't get in. And if it's too big of a gear, then you'll move too slowly and everyone will be gone. So even just like practicing getting into the pedal quickly and, uh, in an off-road setting too, you know, like UCI races, they'll usually start us like on a paved grid, but at local races, they might start you in like a weird loose gravel or kind of mm -hmm. bumpy section. And you need to practice doing that stuff in not controlled settings and it's a skill just like any other that you'll get more comfortable with um they're like physiological things that we can do also to train that that'll get better you know if it's a fitness thing there's training that you can work on too but i think this is a technique and practice thing as specific specifically if they feel nervous um like i wonder you can practice on like i wonder where stefan is li lining up you know like mm -hmm. i doubt they do call ups by number is it one of those things where everyone just like rushes the start line when and and like how uh mm -hmm. aggressive is Stefan about getting to the front and are they picking like the middle in the back you know mm -hmm. you have to when you get to pick your own start position you have to think about like where can I set myself up to move around as many quick people as I can quickly or like can I start on or near the front if that's possible and looking at the course ahead, like, where's the first turn? If your first turn is like sharp into the right, don't put yourself in a position on the start grid where you're going to, you know, potentially get pinched by a bunch of other people and have to put your foot down, you know, give yourself the best line from the start to be able to make a big pass. And all that stuff is just like, takes practice and you have to be prepared to, uh, prepared to go fight out there. And it's, it's okay that it's like nerve wracking. It just takes practice. Yeah, I have a few things on this one. Uh, first, if you can at the actual course while you're doing your warm up, do a couple of those starts at the start line to choose that gear, and you'll quickly find out which is too easy and which is too hard. Um, second, if you're starting on loose surface, hold your rear brake and slide your wheel back and forth so you actually make like a patch in the dirt that's not loose gravel, so you can at least get that first pedal stroke in without slipping. Um, Can I ask I'm, a question on that really quick? Uh, cause I, I, I always employ that approach and in motocross, what we used to do is we used to like my dad or me, Ottawa. he would like, uh, no, like he would hold my bike and then I would pack out a line in the dirt with my boots. And in some races, it's not allowed to go in front of the gate, but in the back of the gate, you could do it. And I've always wondered the same because in most cross country races, I do. I clear out the stones because they, they almost always start us on like gravel. I clear out the stones underneath my tires and I give myself like 15, 20 feet ahead of me where I'm like, if I have time, I clear out stones and that's yeah. like my path. Is that illegal Ivy in like UCI racing, for example? I, I don't know. Like most of UCI races start on pavement. I think like she mentioned, like, I don't think I've ever, yeah. even if it's a mountain bike race, I feel like it's either pavement or grass. It seems like it's pretty mm -hmm. rare that you're starting on like loose gravel. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But think of uh Bale, I think it was, where they started us on like loose dirt. I always remember doing that. I think the worst yeah, was it, Fontana. Yeah. You'd start on the broken oh, asphalt. It oh, was terrible. It was chip seal chunks yeah. that they just so like, you have to like around. clear 
like I clear out like a good five feet of yeah. buff, like ahead of me. So like, even when you got the initial pedal, you could like actually have some time. Yeah. Uh, that's the other thing too, is you can look like, instead of lining up just, you know, randomly like look and see like, Oh, like, here's a nice, like clean line. I'm going to line up here instead of lining up in this ditch where there's rocks. I think like you can pay attention to that. And, um, yeah. And like Ivy mentioned with the turns, like maybe you want to start outside. Sometimes you can gamble and go inside. If you're really confident, you can, you know, <laughs> give it and take it, take tricky. them up the inside. But, yeah. uh, yeah, just whatever you're com comfortable with, you know, and if you're starting out and it's your first few races, I'd recommend like starting on the outsides of the bunch, like mm -hmm. just cause there's less people and it's a little less stressful to line up on the outside. Uh, so I think that's probably be helpful and, you know, maybe, like practice getting in your pedals and, uh, make sure your cleats aren't too tight. Make sure there's no rocks stuck into your bottom of your shoe. Like if there's like a, you know, if you've been doing, if you've been riding cycle cross laps and you're getting off your bike, there's good odds that like there could be a piece of gravel stuck between your cleat and the side of your, like your lugs on your shoe. Mm -hmm. So like stuff like that can make a huge difference. Like, or if there's mud mm -hmm. in there, like just these small things can make a huge difference in getting into your pedal quick and efficiently. So, and if you don't yeah. get in your pedal, just, keep pedaling, just like flat foot that thing. And then worry about it later. That's like a yeah. big thing that I noticed a lot of people do is they'll, you know, they're still trying to fight to get in their pedal as the start's going. And you're just, people are just blowing past you. If you just keep pedaling, it just <laughs> doesn't matter. Like you're going to find your way into it eventually. And it doesn't matter if you're not in it right away. Um, you can also start sitting, sitting down instead of standing up, which gives you more traction. Uh -huh. Um, most of the times on a cycle cross bike, you can reach the ground, like with your tippy toe. You can do that. And if you're on a mountain bike, you can just drop your dropper a little bit and then you can reach the ground, which is nice. And you can have more traction on the rear. And it's also, you're not going to like really mess up. If you slip your pedal, you're going to be able to keep pedaling. Or if you're standing and you miss your pedal, you, you're more likely just to roll straight off that thing and be in trouble. So Keegan's talking about when you're waiting for the whistle, when you're like exactly. in the final right? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, not not sitting down moving forward. Yeah. <laughs> <Just> like, <laughs> yeah. I thought I should clarify. Yeah, yeah thanks for clarifying. Just like, <laughs> like when they say like when they say like 30 seconds to the start or whatever, that's when you can like get in your position, get sit on your saddle, saddle or stay yeah. standing. Like depending on if you're on pavement, standing, whatever, whatever you want to do. But I think like sitting down is pretty nice sometimes. I start that way a lot just because it's like gives you it's like a little easier to get in your pedal. You always have traction. Um mm -hmm. I've noticed a lot of people start really standing up really far forward, and sometimes it makes it more difficult because you have no traction and um, yeah, you're committed to eating that you pedal guys first thing <laughs> about your, about your crank position. Do you mm -hmm. guys have your cranks totally level or do you do like a few degrees above level or do you do one up one fully down? I do this like, like 10 45. Yeah. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> I love I'd it. say it's probably like between level and vertical. Like, so that way there's more downstroke, but you still have enough. It's still easy to get leverage on it. I think if mm -hmm. you're level it's 1045, that's too. pedal stroke, <laughs> probably 1045. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, I guess if you're looking at it from the drive side for me, I always start with my right foot. Uh, so if you're looking at it from the Wait, drive side? Yeah, I guess it would be 1045. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. As you also might, as I mentioned, you might want to start with your dominant, whichever foot you descend forward with is probably the foot that you want to have already clipped in. Yes. Mm -hmm. So that's something to think about as well as like my dominant Whichever foot. Whichever one you unclip foot. at the light, I think yes. is like general rule yeah. of thumb for me. Like if you stop at a red light and you try not to think about it, now you'll just fall over because you won't know which one to unclip. But <laughs> <laughs> as you come yeah. to a light, whichever one you take out, I always have out first starts. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. There, there are times too, um, when I start on pavement versus when I start on something loose, it actually changes in terms of where my pedal position is a bit like, cause if I have perfect traction and I'm starting on pavement, I'm going to start with my pedal a little higher and I'll do that because then I can get some solid torque out of that thing. And I don't have to worry about losing traction. Whereas if I'm starting on something that's going, and I might, I might even start on a slightly heavier gear if I'm in between like, and I can pick, but then if I'm on loose dirt, I'm going to start maybe with my pedal a bit lower. So that initial bit of torque that I put into the pedals isn't going to cause me to lose traction as easily. So it's like uh, 15 on the road. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I love it. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, it, it, it does really all depend. One, one thing I think is, it sounds like Stefan in this case is also not just the initial start, but then losing positions thereafter. And the one thing I think that's really important to communicate to racers is, you know, if you haven't done, Ivy's mentioned this a lot on the podcast, like bumping drills and just getting comfortable making contact with other riders. 
making contact with other riders is okay on a start. It's going to happen. And it's if somebody bumps you, it's not like a bad thing on them. It's not a bad thing on you. That's the start. And everybody should just understand that that's how it is, right? Some bumping is going to happen. Sure, um, you know these people though. Like, don't just go out on your commute and start bumping people on your yeah. way to work. Like, <laughs> yeah, fair. <laughs> make fair sure point. you know who you're practicing with. <laughs> yeah. Um, but you're like in those situations, it's everybody's right to own their space, not to encroach on other people's space. And what I mean by that isn't bumping them. What I mean by that is just like taking somebody's line totally away. Like, uh, you know, when you get to more competitive, higher levels, that's going to happen. If their handlebars are in front of your bars, they're going to take that space. And that's the game you play. But at these lower categories, yeah, yeah, yeah. At these lower categories, like, you know, you own your space. It's yours. And don't be afraid to own that space. And what, what owning that space means is keeping your line. And that means maintaining the space around you and knowing that if somebody bumps you, it's okay. It doesn't mean that you have to deviate or cede to them. You can just continue on your line if they bump you. I think that's something that I see a lot of beginners not fully understand. And I think that if there's contact, they need to then react to that contact, typically by slowing down or moving over or doing anything like that. And that's oddly enough, kind of makes the start more dangerous. If you just hold your space and everybody, you know, like masters racers yelled everybody to hold their line, but really it's just you respecting your own space. And if you do that, then, uh, it really helps a ton. You can have confidence that you own that space. You may not be the best starter, but you own the space, you know, and that's yours. So another easy thing to, to focus on is like, you might, your goal might be just hold position at the start, but if you try and hold position, you're going to go backwards. You need to focus on like, if you're not going, if you're not focusing on moving forward through the pack, you're going to end up at the back. That's one thing mm-hmm. I've took me a while to, that's, I think that applies to like everything, cross road, mountain bike. Like you always have to be focusing on moving forward and you'll kind of stay in the same place. Just mm-hmm. constantly filling gaps. If you see a gap open, if you, you need to take that cause someone else will. Yeah. And yeah. So otherwise you're going to end up back the very back if you just keep focusing on holding your position because that was always you know racing world cups that was like the goal like i'm just going to hold position easy the next thing you know you're 50th so you gotta just focus on moving forward and then in the end you end up staying kind of where you are (laughs) (laughs) alex i I had three things on this before we move on first that first corner just like a general rule of thumb normally for me is if you take the apex and you drew a line to the back of the grid that's essentially where you should start. So if you're closer to the front, you can take the apex of the corner. And as you get further back, the more likelihood that the apex is going to be clogged and you can take the sweeping line around. Mm -hmm. So just a general rule of thumb for kind of starting spot versus that first corner. Uh, Second, something that I know people do, I don't personally, but it could help just take, like make it a little easier mentally is they hold their front brake and they actually apply pressure to that foot that's clipped in. So all they have to do when the gun goes off is remove their finger from the front brake and they're going. Mm. So it might just make kind of getting into these starts a little easier for you. And then the last thing is something that's commonly overlooked is a good spot to press your shifter in a sprint. I think everybody who rides a lot probably doesn't think about this, but they shift at the same point in their sprint every time because they know the lag on their rear derailleur and that when it's going to shift as you come over. So practice that, like standing up and finding a good spot to shift. So you're not like clunking gears or skipping or anything like that to make it super smooth as you're shifting up in the gears to get going faster. That's a really good tip right there, because it's funny. Like I I've even seen, like, you can see some amateurs, like when they start off, they start off in too low of a gear. And if you're having to go click, click, click on a start, like you're in the wrong gear, like it should not be click, click, click. Like (laughs) then you're just going to dump gears right down your cassette. Right. When you start, it's going to be more like click, click, click. I yeah, normally have it in a rhythm. You know? I, I feel like I normally have it in a rhythm with like, it's always when my right side, my right hand drops in a sprint, I'll shift mm-hmm. there and then come back and then shift again. Like, I yeah. feel like if I'm dropping more than one gear at a time, I started in the wrong gear. For sure. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And really, really good. Uh, really good points there, Alex. Um, I also start with my brakes on. I think it's a moto habit. I don't, do, I do, do you too. guys, or does everybody do it? I start pretty loaded. Like the front brake is like pulled pretty hard. There's a lot of pressure yep. on the pedal and then you release the brake and the pedal. I feel like I do that more so when I'm on the very front or like second row, but if you're further back, you can't rely on the person in front of you to go right when the gun goes, you kind of have to watch. That must be watch why I don't them. do it. 
you have to pay attention to, to what's going on. I also um, give myself a little bit of room. Do you give yourself a little bit of room if you have to start behind someone? Like maybe yeah. once if you like once you grid and line up, but then when you get like 30 sec minute or 30 seconds, I just like inch back a little bit to give myself a little space to start moving. Do you do that? Yeah, it yeah, kind of kinda, yeah, it kind of depends on the rider and how much I trust them. And <laughs> yeah. like you get to know you get to know your competition pretty well too. And you race people like week in and week out and you know like I'm not going to line up behind this person. We're going to line up over here instead. Even if, (laughs) even if it's like means you're going to be a a row back, you'll pick lining up behind different people. Um, You just things you get to know. And also like you're in the very back, you can just line, just give yourself lots of room, you know, that way when the gun, when the gun goes off, you can get your pedals before everyone else does and you can roll them. So yeah, if you're you're in the way back too, like the game changes, right? Like at that point, what you're doing with the start isn't trying to take off as fast as you can. It's all about vision. It's all about looking ahead and finding pockets and be creative. Like you're not just going straight down that straight start or start straight. You're going to be looking for spots to, to kind of take it open. The person that I would want to follow the most in a race would be Richie rude. Like the, like a down or an enduro racer. If you think about it, are probably the best at clipping in out of anybody. Like, cause they have their stages that they have to do. Then they're having to clip out like pretty regularly down a run, whereas downhill riders don't do it as often. Right. Like they, and also Richie's We I posted a video. If you look on his Instagram, you can see it, I think, but of him sprinting dear me, like the amount of power that that guy puts out, like I would have no worries about being stuck behind him. <laughs> like I'd just be trying to hold on to the draft. <laughs> so see how but yeah. good he is in a Peloton though. <laughs> What's that? See how good he is in a Peloton though. He yeah, just just it wouldn't matter. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's <would> just... true. <laughs> yeah. yeah, big boy, Richie Smash. So, um, <laughs> all right, uh, this next one's from Mikkel. I, and I hope I'm pronouncing your name right, Mikkel. Uh, I'm on a custom plan, high volume, but I'd like to increase the volume further. During weekends, I would like to ride gravel group rides, typically about three to five hours, mainly zone two. Boom, big red flag right there saying like everybody, I see this all the time. People are like, yeah, I go for group rides and typically zone two. And like, if you go back and look at it, right, Ivy, it ain't zone two. No. Like, uh, I don't know where there's gravel group rides. It sounds fun. Yeah. Well, Unless like, it's like, he means by group ride, maybe he means like three or four people and it's just like a small group. So maybe he is actually doing zone two. And maybe it's possibly. a training ride with a group. Maybe, yeah. Maybe it's not a traditional like group ride per se. It's more like, a few buddies and it actually is they're just riding you know even then two. the, yeah, the rotation of, of shame where it's the, like oh no <laughs> nope, you're doing 222 uh-uh. you know how many people actually do that though like they're on this podcast like oh keegan gosh. and alex like you guys like honestly ivy and i see this all the time with athletes and they're like no it was a chill ride i did zone two the whole time they didn't do zone two the whole time like they fluctuate a ton there are very, very, very few riders that go out and actually do a zone two ride or actually ride within zone as they should. Like it's a skill to develop. It's really tough. Like if you look at Alex's rides, if you look at Keegan's rides, they'll look like they're beautiful charts because they're really good at doing that. Even on varied terrain, most people, especially for riding gravel, probably varied terrain, rolling Hills. It's tough. So I just want to make that point be uh, critical of yourself when you think like, yeah, I mean, it's just going to be in zone two. It'll be chill. Look back at it afterward and look how much time you actually spent in zone two and look if you had any like long sustained blocks in there, or if it was constantly interrupted and changed around. Um, talking to Keegan's coach, he hates nothing more than when his athletes interrupt their training with like, you know, instead of staying within zone where they should be they're you know, going North or South or heck even stopping doing that sort of stuff. He hates it. And like, yeah, uh, us too. We don't like he it. I might drop Keegan then. I mean, he's always stopping for his hostess <laughs> cookies at the gas station. <laughs> That's a good point. Yeah. Yeah. Ivy, were you going to say something? Snacks. Oh yeah. This is just like a, a, a sad and personal question topic for me too, because I feel like so many homies want to, uh, you know, go on group rides or want me to ride with them. And there have been like a number of times this, this summer in a big training block where it's like, no, no, it's like, it's like, it'll be easy for you. Like we're doing this and it'll be like, it'll be chill for you. And I have to, and I'll maybe, you know, give him a shot and be like, okay, like I'll start with you and we'll see how it goes. And sure enough, like 45 minutes into the ride, I'm like, y'all got to go. Like I told you I'm doing endurance today. Like this is Mm -hmm. what I'm doing. Like, I'm really sorry. And it makes me feel like a jerk and I feel so bad, but to 
really you can't in feel that. bad you just need to do you, your thing i know yeah. it's true yeah. and you shouldn't just, feel bad you just gotta do your right? thing and they know it going in like i do plenty of rides <laughs> with friends and they know like oh this is keegan's doing his thing i'm either gonna do that or i'm not like that's yep. that's exactly you know, what i'm sure I alex can that. agree like I'm either gonna you're gonna drop me or i'm gonna drop you or we're gonna be friends there's only three options yeah, <laughs> yeah or, or you can like put your ego aside you can sit, one of us can sit on if it's too hard like i'll i'll do that a fair bit you know like if i'm riding with for example russell in tucson he's got like like a, a regular endurance day with like some 30 minute tempo blocks and i've just got endurance i'll just sit on for his tempo and just draft and then when he's done with the tempo then we can ride together again and like vice versa so i think you can also make it work if you just like think about it a little and be like, Oh, uh, if it's flat, I can just sit on and do the power I need to do, or they can sit on for a bit if they need a break. Like mm-hmm. I mean, it's like when John, I did yeah. that training camp, like you spent some time sitting on my wheel and it's like, it's fine. <laughs> it's still, like, ride together. A whole lot of time. <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> it's just the way it is. You just need to like adjust. You can, you can, you can still do your training and ride with people. If you like plan accordingly and just make sure you do a right, yeah. the right route too. Like you could, you wouldn't want to go do a route with a ton of climbing and, then, then it's like based off, then you have to ride with someone who's the same watts per kilo as you. But if you're riding on the flats, there's always a way. Like you can ride a gravel bike, they can ride a road bike. Like we do, I do that a lot too. Like there's always yeah, ways so you me can and my mom do, make man. it work. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> if you can put your ego away, you can make it work. I think normally yeah. like you'll swap a road, like I'll swap my road bike for a mountain bike, which is fine with me because I'd rather ride that bike anyway. And then me and friends can ride together and close that gap. But I mean, it's kind of like a, a drop ride of sorts. Like Keegan said, like I tell him, like my range is X to X and you won't find me outside of it. So it's like you go both ways, right? Like if you drop me, it's like, have a great ride. Like Fine, that's the just the way it is. Yeah. We'll see you. Yeah. Yeah. So you guys yeah. know what you're doing going into that ride. And for Mikkel, they should know going into this ride that it's not going to be mainly zone two. And when asking how, you know, is it ruining a structure training? uh you shouldn't count on those right like use it as a training ride then and don't like not do it because being social and like doing those rides is probably really important to you um and really mm-hmm. en- enriching and you should still do it but consider I think it it's training fun for everybody right like yeah i think we all love to put a group ride in there i mean keegan does the tucson one every I, weekend i yeah i do the specialized <laughs> lunch ride whenever i can like i think you just can't discount it or think you can control the pace like you can't make everybody else do zone two if it's a like an open group ride otherwise like if keegan said if it's four or five people if you can just tell them all like this is the pace and they're not on training plans and they're just like yeah i just want to ride with you then you can keep it at that pace and i mean it takes a unique group to do that because there will be the times when they're not looking at their power meter i don't know how they do it but they just don't look down at their computer and then you have to tell them to slow down <laughs> Alex is like how do you ride <laughs> how do you do it <laughs> i don't even know where you're yeah. going <laughs> yeah um i want to finish off mikhail's question because ivy you you preempted that really well mikhail says do i ruin my structured training by doing these rides uh, typically i should do two ride or two hour rides during weekends according to the plan so in this case mikhail <clears throat> has two hour rides scheduled on the weekend those two hour rides are not just two hours at a certain if those two hour rides are like really specific um it's not crazy variable in most cases those are probably going to be a day where it's longer and you're doing zone two but you're probably going to be sitting toward the top of zone two like maybe end plus like that that sort of range And then the other day, it's probably going to be tempo intervals, maybe some sweet spot intervals. One big mistake I see is, uh, we see this all the time, and we're actually going to have a blog post on this coming up about, we recommend to a bunch of athletes that they do the low volume plan and they supplement it with their outdoor riding. Uh, And that is to allow for wiggle room like this. But that said, even in those circumstances, there are a lot of athletes that just think, well, yeah, I'm doing my three workouts a week that are structured. And then I'm just doing like, I'm just riding after that. But if you look at the just riding and I'm saying that in quotes here, like it's not just riding, it's really hard. Like, like you're, you're spending a huge amount of time across, you know, in threshold and above, and you're not spending a lot of time, consistent time down in lower portions of the range there. And that sort of stuff, like you just have to manage expectations. And I think that the big thing I want to communicate to Mikel and other athletes here is that it's really illuminating to look back at a ride that you did, let's just say 0.85 IF, like uh, 85% of your FTP is what you ended up with after the ride. And if you did that, that might have been something like an over under workout, depending on how long the breaks were. It might've been something like a sweet spot or tempo workout. 
if you were holding consistent power throughout that workout, but you could also have just chased Strava comms and like, that were like 30, 30 seconds long. And then you just hammered yourself and then ended up at that 0.85 IF. It's not specific enough to just say same duration and same IF. So it's the same thing. It's like, it's basically like I did the workout. That's not the case. Like if you're looking for the workout to give you the benefit that's intended, then you just do the workout. And if you're looking, if you substitute that, then don't expect the benefit. And this is like, I know this sounds kind of harsh, but it's absolutely necessary if you're expecting a certain outcome. Like you can't, you can't trick yourself into thinking that the outcome is going to happen if you're not specific about making it happen. And this is I the think, job of these athletes here that are with us. Like that's their job is to be specific about that stuff or else they're not doing their job right. Um, for all of us that are cyclists that maybe aren't paid to do this, in that case, that's why on those rides, like you just need to make sure maybe Mikel, the best choice is to step back from high volume into mid volume or maybe even low volume. Because then that way you can go out and do these rides that are that are the reason why you ride and the what reason why you train and you can still get them in. And you don't have to look back with this critical eye to say, did I specifically match on this group ride where I was riding with other people that I still specifically match the actual structure of the workout? Because nobody wants to ride with that person if the premise is just going out for a gravel ride. Um, so make sure that you're setting expectations appropriately and being realistic with yourself. Cause if I had a dollar for every time athletes said that they're following the exact advice on the podcast, but I don't know why these workouts are so hard and I can't do a low volume plan. Mm -hmm. It's like, well, you're like chasing 37 comms per ride when you're going out and doing it otherwise. So <laughs> what do you expect? Of course, you're going to be tired every time you get on the bike, just because it don't have intervals doesn't mean that you're not tiring yourself out. So so that's, that would be my advice here. This is personal nerve hit very strongly. So. Just, I think the only thing I want to touch on is ruined is a very strong word. Mm -hmm. One, one group ride is not going to ruin your training as, as we talked about with racing after, you know, not optimal lead up. I think it's not optimal, but you also have to keep in mind if we were going to be completely optimal to create like the best machine body cyclist we could we also wouldn't race because we can't control that either mm -hmm. so i think you just i think the biggest takeaway for me is that you have to account for it and not trick yourself into thinking it's zone two and you can control it unless it is just a group ride with friends that you can actually tell them like we're just going to go this pace and everybody's on board like jonathan said if the premise is we're going to go for a gravel ride and we're going to ride how we feel they could even be zone one depending on who you're riding with so i think mm -hmm. just being aware of that and leaving room for it is, is the best way. And normally the way I approach it is I'm more flexible when I'm further away from races, when I have more time to correct. So it's like, if I did the group ride on top of a week of training and then I feel blown, like we can just throw on a couple easy days, come back from it and then keep going with training. Whereas, you know, if I did that, got blown and we went into a race, that's probably not ideal. So I think mm -hmm. keeping that in mind as well, but I think it's super important to have those mental breaks. Like if you ride to do these group rides, then then set up your plan so you're fit for these group rides and put them in your plan. Like don't yeah. don't shy away from them because they're not optimal. Like no one's no one's perfectly optimal. Again, we wouldn't race if we were. So I think that's just important. Yeah. Most yeah. of us don't train to be good at training. We train to be good at riding or racing, right? Uh depending on whatever your goals are. I'm so the best trainer. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> so in, in this case, though, this is a, Alex, you highlighted a super important principle that I want to put some words around for people. It's what you do consistently that changes you, not what you do occasionally. And that's a really important thing. Now, consistently is the key thing. That doesn't mean that just because you do one workout a week or you do three workouts a week and one easy ride a week, that that's not the majority of your experience. Therefore, it won't affect you. If you do this every week, that will affect you. That affects who you become. So what you do consistently changes you. What you do occasionally does not. So uh, just make sure that you're looking at it through that lens. Uh, Keegan, I, I don't know if you were going to jump in and say something. Oh, I was just going to say that like uh, also group rides, There's they might not be like perfect for training or your plan, but I still think there's a lot you can gain from them, um, especially if it's like a pretty hard drop ride. I mean, then you're like you can treat it as a race and try different tactics and you can like, you're also at the mercy of other people. Like 
at the shootout, Russell and I go in there with the intention of just trying to kill each other. Like I'll attack and then he counterattacks me right when I get caught. And like, then you're at the mercy of just hanging on and you're just staring at the hub, like cross-eyed. And that's like having to respond to efforts like that, especially when there's not racing around for a while is like something that is kind of hard to replicate in training. I think you can always go harder in a group rider in a race than you can in training. And even if you don't get like that, exactly like 20 minutes of zone six or whatever the target of the training is maybe you'll only get 12 but it's like really high quality and then instead of doing a minute long interval maybe you have to push that same minute power for like a minute 15 and i think it like replicates the more dynamics of racing and i think sure you wouldn't want to do three group rides a week or whatever but i think it's a good thing to do here and there and i think you can learn a lot from it whether that's like learning how to pace line or you know uh like learning how to attack out of the group and what's the most efficient. And uh, so, yeah, I don't think you should always shy away from them. I think that you just need to make sure it fits in with your plan and make sure it's not too much or that's going to burn you out. Um, so like Alex and John Ivy said, like you just need to make it, find a way to integrate it. And then I think there's a lot you can gain from them. So yeah, that's uh, a really good yeah. point on. We're not saying they're like bad, just like you have to make mm-hmm. sure you're recovering from it and make sure it's not over the top because there's so much you can learn from doing these group rides that you can't get from training on your own. Like you don't even know your power meter. You're just go. Yeah. You don't know what's going to happen. You know, um, like like in training, you got two minutes, three minutes, five minutes, but in like, like you said, you're staring at that hub and you're like, I don't know how long this guy's going to go ham (laughs) for. Could be a minute. You you never know who's going to be there. You know, you don't know. You don't know who's fresh. You don't know who's trained. Maybe like for me, I love doing the shootout after like a massive block of training. And then you're just like, just grip the entire time just trying to survive you know and you attack and you know it's going to be like you might not make it if you attack like (laughs) so i think like there's a lot of a lot of stuff you can learn from doing group rides so yeah well said Keegan. well i think that there's and that's something we should probably dispel too right ivy it's not that we're we're anti-group ride it's not that we're anti-race ride it's not that we're any of that stuff anti even just riding instead of even just solo just doing whatever you think whatever your thing is, we're not against that. It's just when you take those things and you conflate it with training, then that's when it becomes complicated. Yeah. When you're not able to, as an athlete, look at it with a clear lens of like what it actually is or was, um, Mm -hmm. that's when it becomes problematic. doesn't mean Mm -hmm. that it's not enriching and serves its purpose. You just have to see it for what it is. Yeah. You, you've mentioned, I, I know talking to you, Keegan, sometimes you skip the shootout and like, it's not like in like, you would otherwise do it, but you skip it at times because right. or like, some days, like I also just go in and just sit in the entire time. I just sit in the back of the bunch and just use it as like a leg speed motor pace day. Like I never go over 300 Watts. It's all just like, like imagine tempo being... and like, <laughs> yeah, I know you can just sit in. I know it's like, it's kind of, a, it's a luxury because there's only a few of us that can do like, <laughs> I that use the for leg speed. <laughs> like, yeah, but yeah. there are, man, there's also a group, like, for example, there's also like the, there's like the earlier shootout that goes, it's easier. Right. So like, if you don't, if you don't have the ability to sit in and make it easy for the the hard one, you can go like, for example, for Sophia, she can go to the early one and then she like can sit in and it can be like, she can use it as like a leg speed workout, but if she goes in the hard one, then even just sitting in it's wide open. So I think there's also, you can you also find the right group ride. There's a, figuring. yeah, there's yeah. a and B group rides, you know, most group rides have an A and a B group too. Like, I don't like, it seems like yeah. for the most part, like even in park city, we have like an A, B and C group. So you can choose which one you're going. And even if you have the ability to win the A ride, maybe you just do the B ride and just like, just sit in and don't pull. And you can use it as like a leg speed, like kind of a chill yeah. session. So I do, and do sometimes that, like, they like, have the B ride be like the groupetto almost like you can fight for the A group and then you kind of fall right. back to that B group because they're doing the same ride, which you is always, you don't always have to win. You know, you always have to race to win. You can use the group ride for completely different purposes. So there's no winning the group ride anyway. Yeah. <laughs> Some <laughs> might argue differently. Uh, yeah, I think... <laughs> but Look, if, I, I agree. if I won the shootout, but... something like that, that might be like the highest thing on my Palmaris right there. Because like I'll lead you yeah. out. You come out and I'll we'll, we'll make it happen. <laughs> we'll, we'll make oh, it yeah. happen. Awesome. Yeah. I'll Just sweep. hope Quinn no Simmons problem. isn't there again. You. So uh that dude's a motor. Um, but with uh one thing that's super exciting for us here at Trainer Road 
And this is a high priority uh, for our company. And we have awesome team working on it and they're making progress is workout levels V2 is what we call it. But the ability to actually analyze it for you and to give you the credit and show like you got this much credit in these different zones on this outside ride. And it's extremely intelligent. It's able to understand. It's not just time and zone. It's able to understand the cumulative effect of the ride. It's able to uh, understand everything that's way deeper than just looking at time and zone. So that's going to be super helpful. I've been using as it's evolved over the past nine months now, I've been using it and it's been extremely informative uh, for me. And it's helped me understand that just because a group ride makes me tired doesn't mean it was productive training in a lot of cases. Uh, and that, you know, wow, that did actually add more strain than I anticipated it would or vice versa. So that's coming. We're working on it. We're making great progress. Stay tuned. It's going to be really exciting. Um, Okay, I want to jump over to Matt's question because this kind of paralleled what we were talking about a little bit there in the last question. Matt says, I seem to have the opposite problem of most triathletes and routinely underbike the cycling leg of triathlons. And that usually just means like uh, riding below expected performance levels. Oh, That's what I happened. was like, how do you, how do you underbike on the road? <laughs> yeah. 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 Who, yeah like, uh, I, yeah, I don't know how you mill tires. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. 17 mill tires. Um, so, uh, Matt mentions that they underbike the cycling leg of triathlons, despite having raced consistently for nearly 10 years over sprints, Olympic and half Ironman distances. I've almost never finished the bike leg with an average or normalized power, even close to the bottom range for a recommended intensity factor for a given distance in the race. I feel like I'm going appropriately hard for the given distance, but my power and heart rate typically say otherwise. And I end up riding what on paper looks like it would be a moderate training ride. Is it possible the solution here is any more complex than just harden up and ride harder? And if not, any tips on breaking through what may be a mental barrier? So this almost seems like it's not like Matt like uh, just elects to ride easy and that's it, but there's like an actual limiter where that sort of pace feels harder on race day than it would otherwise in like training. Ivy, what are your thoughts? Um, can I pass? Can I go later? Yeah. I see. Yeah. <laughs> this is tricky. It is. I... Does it resonate with any of you too? Is it, does anybody want to kick it off first? I have thoughts, but I'd rather hear from you guys first. Yeah, I'll go. <laughs> Way to go. Um, yeah, I think that's a pretty good uh it's a pretty good question. I think sometimes it come down it might come down to like a bit of a like a race nerves and maybe you're like scared of blowing up. And I think sometimes you have to push yourself to the point of fully detonating to realize that like you can push a bit harder. Like maybe you're worried like, Oh, if I go too hard, I'm going to like the run's going to be slow, but maybe you need to push yourself all the way to that point of actually having a really bad race in order and then back it off. Like, okay, that was too much. Maybe we'll back off a few percent and find that limiter. Um, yeah. Or maybe it's as simple as, you know, maybe you just need to harden up. Maybe you need to write something on your handlebars. I don't, I don't know. Like I think, there's, you do uh, write things on your handlebars quite a lot. I write stuff on my handlebars a lot because it's, yeah. it's a place you're always living. You're, when you know, you're going hard or like you start to crack, you look down, you're like, oh, we can go harder than this. And I think there's, <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know. I think there's a few different strategies you could try. Um, you could also try not looking at your computer and just going off feel, like just giving it and see what happens. Uh, maybe you might learn that you're capable of more than you think. Um Maybe you need to look at your power meter more. Maybe you're not looking at it enough and you should be like, you'd be like oh, because in training, maybe you know, for example, you can hold 270 watts and there's no reason you can't do that in the race. You just need to do it and tell yourself, I have to do this. And that's, mm -hmm. I mean, that's what I do when I do like uh, the white room FKT. Like I know, you know, John and I ran on best bike split and I talked to my coach and he's like, you should be able to ride 300 watts. And I'm like, okay, that's what we're going to do. And you just do it. And if, if like physiology says you can do it and, you know, your training says you can, there's no reason you can't, um, mm -hmm. as long as everything else goes to plan, as long as your fueling's on and, you know, obviously there's bad days and that happens and times you just can't do what you can do. Um, so yeah, I just try, try a few of those different things and see what works. You know, I don't know, like you didn't really go into detail of how much you look at your power meter and how much you focus on that. So maybe you need to look at it more, maybe less. I just, yeah, take all that into consideration and see what might work. And that's why the solution for this is so tricky, right? Because they feel like they're going appropriately hard and they acknowledge that it's maybe a mental barrier. So how do you mm -hmm. break through that? 
Like, and I, was there a race over the last 10 years of Matt's career where they actually did crack themselves wide open on the bike leg and haven't mentally recovered or something? Like, what will it take? Would it, would it take that for, like, yeah. maybe Matt pushing themselves to absolutely cracking in the bike leg to inspire some confidence and no they actually can't go much harder like well, gotta risk it for the biscuit sometimes you know <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well this is uh you bring up a, an alex i want to hear from you on this a, a really quick insight into what you were just saying there ivy I, I, if you talk to a lot of triathletes that have been doing it for quite a while that are well trained that you know know what they're doing when they are not doing tri training and they're just like on a bike ride and they get to go hard. In fact, we see this, like when we go to Kona and we would do these group rides, there'd be triathletes that were there supporting somebody, but not racing. And we would go hard on some of the climbs there and stuff. And they'd be like, I never knew I was capable of this. And the reason that they never knew it is because they, if you think about it, triathlon for an age grouper, it's very much about racing within yourself. Right. So they, in most cases, they aren't battling for the lead or doing anything like that. So they aren't really like stretching the limits. They're trying to be conservative because they've got a run coming up. So they never really bike as hard as they can in the race. And then if you think about their training, in many cases, it's quite measured and controlled. And triathletes tend to be folks that that lean toward that a bit more. So this could absolutely be the case, like you're saying, Ivy, where Matt hasn't cracked it wide open. Uh, there's some cobwebs in there. And like, and if he can just crack it wide open and blow out the cobwebs for a bit, maybe it can change things and, and open up his eyes. Because I don't know if you've noticed this too, but when we all do like a long session, like a long bit of training, like a training block where we're spending time at a really similar intensity, the relativity comes into play. And suddenly anything higher than that feels a lot higher than that at, at the first, like at first and then once you get used to that higher intensity, you're like, oh, okay, I'm not dying. Actually, I'm fine. It's just like, this is what Every harder season. feels like. Every base right? season ever. <laughs> yeah. It's like, like over-unders is... too, though, on the opposite end. Like uh -huh. when you do the two minutes hard, like the three minutes of what would be hard before is like, oh, this is really nice, actually. Yes. Yeah. Like relativity is really powerful there. And in the case of a triathlete where they aren't regularly doing these group rides or these races where they're really pushing themselves in their limits, they could absolutely have, uh, like false ceilings that are in place that aren't intentional, but they're absolutely, they have an effect on, on their performance to perform. Alex, uh, what are your thoughts? Yeah. I like the thought of kind of trying different things. Like Keegan was saying, it's hard to say from the question, whether or not they're two in the numbers or not in the numbers enough. I think my, I would lean towards being a numbers nerd, like staring at the power meter and just making myself do that 0.8 or, or whatever I'm shooting for until I blow up. Like, I think mm -hmm. triathlon's nice because it's kind of a very controlled environment. Like you can just, I'm going to just do 300 Watts for the whole thing and do it till I can't because like Keegan said, the training and the physiology and the training he's saying says he can do that. So why not just try and see what happens? Um, mm -hmm. On the flip side, you may find out that you can do that when you just do a bike training day, but you can't do it after a swim and before a run. And then you kind of learn from that and you dial in what that is, but it also can inform training. Maybe you need more brick workouts and you need to practice coming off a swim onto a bike or going from a bike onto a run and kind of perfect that. Yeah. And that's like a, a good, a brick workout is a great opportunity for them to test this, right? So just see how, what it's like when they actually do hold 0.8 for whatever their expected bike split time is, and then go out there and see how you run. I've heard that from so many athletes that they train with trainer road, they get really fast and they've done triathlons before, but then they go into the triathlon and they're terrified during the bike split because they're like, shoot, I should not be riding at this sort of wattage. I've never done this before. Like my run, I'm going to blow up my run, but they just need to learn to trust themselves because then when they get off the bike, turns out they actually can back it up. And honestly, what's the worst thing that happens? I don't know. Maybe you're battling for the win in your age group, Matt, and I don't know, but for there's a lot of age groupers in every field and only one winner. Like if you're not winning, what's the downside of you pushing it and seeing how it goes on the bike? Like what you, you do a walk run during the run. Like that's fine. It's I not the end of the world. You're not paid to do it. <laughs> 
You know? That's why I was afraid to initially answer this because like I don't know triathlons and I don't know what the worst case scenario is if you blow up on the bike. Is it okay to walk in a triathlon? You don't, yeah, you don't, don't have know. to run. It's, <laughs> yeah. it's honestly really run. common for age groupers to walk aid stations or to do run walk sort of things in in like if you're looking at like half distance and going up from there. So it's not the end of the world. Like, I mean, even if you DNF, at least you're like, whoa, I cooked myself on the bike. That was sweet. Like, <laughs> like yes. you know, you just change your like, change your perspective. Be like impressed by yourself, by what you just did on the bike. And it's going to set new limits for you later on. And you're going to figure things out about yourself. Like, look, if, if you're Alex and you're Keegan and you're Ivy and like your job is to do well, you even see them throwing things at the wall and seeing if they're going to stick in races. And I think that's kind of the cool part about racing is that's your chance to do that. Like in training, be measured. And in racing, you know, if you know enough about yourself and your competition and there's a lot rides on this result, then be measured. But otherwise, experiment, have fun with it. Like you, you might actually your, learn some cool stuff. If that's your mental space, like you're looking at that and you're like, oh, I'm going to blow up my run. I think that's where Keegan was onto something with like writing down a mantra or something that kind of brings you back to what that goal was. And it could even be as simple as like what you said, John, you could write, see what sticks on your handlebars. Like, and that reminds you like today is just about sending it and see what sticks, like whatever recenters you to like what, when you went into the race and were like, that's my goal, whatever brought you there, get a mantra that brings you back to that in the race and reminds you like my whole goal today is just to do 300 Watts on this bike. Like that's it. And then I'm going to go run and see what happens. Mm -hmm. Then there are races like Leadville. Don't listen to us here. Stick to a plan very tightly. Like, like in a race, one point one IF. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Please no. <laughs> but like that, where there's like a razor's edge up at altitude, that's a bit different, right? Like, you know, you you can't just go and throw what throw something at the wall when you're going up St. Kevin's and you have the rest of the day. Um, but you still know what you can do. Like you still yes. know, like maybe it's point six, maybe it's point seven IF, maybe it's point eight. Like you still have that number you can do, and you might as well like try and do that number. You know, you just got to be yeah. more diligent about not going too far over it up there. Cause that's, yeah. that's not the best part. I think that's my favorite part about Leadville is you're always riding like this. You're always just bouncing off the rev limiter, like exploding the whole time, which is kind of yeah. cool because you're so high. There's no, like, there's no lot. Once you go over it, you're just, you're probably not going to ever recover. So watching that's... the run leg of Iron Man reminds me of Leadville. Like, just uh -huh. how like acceptance happens, like when like the lead change at the end, I don't know the athletes, apologies, but like when they like fist bumped and like, he's just slowly running away. This guy knows, like, I can't run that fast, but it's like, you just you, you look at it and you're like, come yeah. on, just close the gap, bro. Just yeah, get there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it's and like, same as led, but like going up Columbine, it's like, all right, well, guess I'm going backwards. <laughs> yeah. I'll see you later. You know, but also, can we cover one thing with power I, as anybody else? I'm trying to think about this. So Leadville is the only race that I can think of where holding my power target was like, uh, this is boring for like the first half of the race. Right. And I was like nervous that it wasn't enough. And then mm -hmm. at the end of that race, just holding that power target, I was like, I cannot believe I'm dying to hold on to 0.75. Like, like I I'm, it's absolutely everything I can possibly do to do yeah. like 220 Watts up at this elevation right now. And normally at that point, I just turn my, I have a screen on my Garmin that I scroll through. Like the go, my go screen is just time. There's no power. There's nothing. I just turn to that and you just go flat out. <laughs> yeah. Because you're trying you're to do like, what you're going to do. And it's disappointing to look down and see these small numbers relatively. And you're like, I, I can't look at this anymore. We're just going to go to the, yeah. we're just going to go full gas now, you know, whatever I, that is, it is, you know, that's like the only exception for me in every other race looking at a power meter does not hold me back every time I like, maybe it's because I set goals too aggressively or something, but every time holding on to my power is like, Oh gosh, this is hard. Like, yeah. and I, I think, think that maybe this is the difference for race. Matt. Maybe it's in like a race plan, right. Where Matt's kind of like, I don't know, maybe he just lacks experience in finding out what his limits are. Like we were talking about too, but riding by power doesn't hold me back. It usually makes me rise to a higher standard. So, yeah, I think Leadville, the, the end is the same for me. Like I've never gotten through that race feeling strong the whole way, but I feel like at the front, it, it's literally that we're just bouncing off the rev limiter and just kind of like trying to find out everybody in the group because we'd rather not descend power line with everybody. So I think maybe it's, like it's a, a game of different. chicken. It's pretty, it's kind of, kind of cool. yeah. you know, like everyone's like pushing and like, 
Like I know this is like, like a little, this is a little hard. It's like uphill <laughs> chicken. Yeah. Like, all right, I'll I'll add two watts. What do you got? All right, I yeah. see you're two watts. I'll raise you three watts. I was like St. Heathens <laughs> this year. Like Lachlan was really pushing it. And I'm like, this is probably harder than I'd want to go, but I'm not gonna. You can't just let him go. Yeah. You know. <laughs> you can't tell him that. No, you're like this Wait, is not how amateurs today, should you know? race Leadville. We need to be clear on this. Like, <laughs> it's very different at the front than it is in the anywhere else. Ivy. I I have an aside question about level. Keegan, yeah. what was your official time? Did you ever? <laughs> yeah, was it six oh one or was it five fifty nine? Because well, apparently, they gave you a shirt with five fifty nine. That one of them was uh, gun time, and one was chip time. <clears throat> so I think, yeah, that that's, don't, that don't take any start advice from Keegan because it takes him two seconds to go one centimeter over the line. Yeah, so I don't know. <laughs> I don't know which one's which. We're gonna take the five fifty nine fifty nine because that's cool. <laughs> on the jacket, uh, it's official. Yeah, that's yeah, another race. Jacket, going, you know, yeah, it's on the jacket. So that's and then also go crossing it, the know? line when they got that photo of your tire crossing the line. It was five fifty nine fifty nine. Yeah, so that's so, what we're gonna okay. take. You know, and okay. that whole race going back to like the uh, what could you have done differently? Like I was like, well. All I had to do was go like two minutes faster or whatever. I would have, or a minute and 36 seconds and I would have had the course record. And like, that's not, that's not, that's like, that's nothing, you know? Yeah. So that's another thing I've been thinking about, even though I won the race, you're like, well, I could have gone faster here. I could have gone faster there. Like there's so, I don't know. There's a lot you can do. So you just yeah. need a four person squad working for you. Like they did. Yeah. But it must be nice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Kind of different circumstances. Also, wasn't it pretty like, uh cool, like favorable conditions even more favorable that day too i remember hearing that they had like a tailwind run on the run back which is pretty rare i don't know yeah i mean maybe no wind there was, is rare there was, on the way back there was a headwind this time for sure dude that headwind when you're coming back like i don't know maybe it's for you all it's very different i mean alex you've had some you've had some times and you've gone boom at, at leadville but like all of the times <laughs> yeah all of the times so I maybe not, you can relate gone boom. <laughs> but after you come back on that single track section and it's like, uh, it's like that scene from Monty Python and the Holy grail when that guy's charging the castle and then like it cuts to them and they look to see what's happening. And then it replays the same clip that he's like charging from the same point to there. And it like replays it four times and all of a sudden they're there. <laughs> but like, <laughs> I felt like that when I was, when we were going back toward power line on just that long, like you know, the pipeline right. road, you know, Oh yeah. my gosh on the dirt road. Cause it feels like you make that same little, like bend right, left, like yeah. seven mm -hmm. times. The one where you like <laughs> go in and around. Uh-huh. Yeah, no, so too. No, we're, we're not. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Dude. And it's so long. And then the wind was just like really strong in the face. That was, it was pretty hard to not like to keep my heads, but it, I managed it by just keeping my head out of that. Like I ignored it. Like later on after the race, I was like, dude, that was terrible. But then in the moment I was just not thinking of that whatsoever. You know, like I was outside of it. You can't let a, a race course, get bigger than. So welcomed at the end of the race, like having a paved climb where you can just <laughs> do whatever the heck you can to get the power up. Yeah. No, you I'm don't gonna have stand, to worry about Yeah. Just flail. Yeah. <laughs> We're just going to go forward. Hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like that's the, sorry, we're going to close here, but this is one tip. I feel like Keegan, you and I have talked about this before too. Um, amateur athletes are really good at making a bigger deal out of a race than they should. Like, in other words, like it psychs them out like big, like the myth of Leadville, for example, just like it weighs so heavy that it ends up affecting in a negative way, how they race. Right. Um, and that happens it at like doesn't. a bunch of different races, but in the end, it's just a bike race, man. Like it's point A to point B and it's going over terrain and it is what it is. Um, there's like, I think that that's one strength that you have in particular of not letting, like, uh, you kind of know where to cut your brain off and not let it think and, and get like into spots where it could spiral. That's something yeah, that all I think of all technology, of technology, apparently. <laughs> yes. That too. Yeah. Yeah. Happens, so anyways. Though. Still some, still some spiraling happens, but do you feel like you that's... spiraled at worlds at all? I mean, that's like the biggest race, the biggest stage. Everything. Uh, not so much there. I was so focused on everything. I mean, really the only race where I've had a lot of that, like spiraling and negative thought is like the 24 hour solo, but I mean, that's <laughs> to be like expected there, you know? Yeah. Uh, Did you want to clip? Same... That's not oh, the one yeah. I would have guessed. Yeah. <clears throat> that one I wanted Which... to quit for sure. Which one would you have guessed, Alex? 
I guess Cape Epic, just because I feel like Road Worlds, it seemed like he had no expectation, was just like, I'm just going to like throw it at the wall and see what sticks. But Cape Epic, I feel like I would go into that and be like, with expectation, because it's a mountain bike race and a stage race, both things that I'd consider Keegan good at. So I, I feel like my biggest spirals, I guess, come from when expectation and reality are so far apart. So I guess I'm assuming that Keegan would have expected more from Cape Epic, but I mean, not in a negative way, yeah, just like trying to put like, myself in your shoes. Yeah. And with Cape Epic too, I think having a partner is like such a different dynamic. Like there's always so much you can do, like a, a lot of it's out of your hands. Uh, that's one thing I had, I mean, you're right. Like I had high expectations there. I think you just have to like kind of let it go. Like, cause it's, it's not all on you. Like you have to rely on your partner to, for, you know, 50% of it. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's, yeah. Are you Agreed. hoping to do Cape Epic next year again? I am. Yeah. Ooh. That'd be sweet. Yeah. Ivy, would you ever want to do Cape Epic? Absolutely not. No. Okay. Okay. Maybe Sorry. if there's a single speed class. Dude, <laughs> Ivy, Ivy and I would make a pretty good team. It's pretty fun. Ah, I just think the number of things in my life that I would have to change to be comfortable at that <laughs> duration of racing. First of all, some fundamental physiological things would need to change. Like, <laughs> I'm just not that kind of writer. So I'd have to, it would be huge for me to feel comfortable doing something like that. I guess I could, but you know, at what cost? <laughs> You'd crush the first hour. The first hour is pinned. Like, mm. Keegan said it was pinned even for the pros, which was surprising oh, yeah, to just me. Cross country race every day for four hours. It's just the way it's it just... is. <laughs> For us amateurs, it was like the first hour, 90 minutes was just like every time I was like, this is the worst idea ever. Like <laughs> this is the best way to set myself up to have a terrible remainder of the day. But it was just what we had to do to stay in position and actually hold on to the group. Like it was just, yeah, just wide open for the first like 90 minutes. And then after that, it was kind of like everyone would just like pop off, you know? And like, and it was just like, you just kind of rode your own. It was crazy too. Like in the first 90 minutes of the race, everyone was like, you know, sharp elbows and, and, and sharp looks. Right. And then after that, everyone was just like commiseration. Like it's so hey, satisfying man. when that happens though. Here you Cause go. like, I feel like when you're going hard <laughs> and you're with a group, you're like, I'm the only one that thinks this hurts. And then as soon as people start popping off, you're like, okay, thank God. It, it hurt yeah. Everybody. Everyone hurts. <laughs> yeah. All right. Sick. Now we're going. Yeah. Oh, well, Ivy and I are doing single track six. Not as I saw that they have a co-ed duo thing. No, nah, man, I want to let you just do your thing. Let's I yeah, yeah. Let's just do our thing. I think yeah. that'll end up for a better race experience at the end for both of us, right? Because then we won't be pushing each other, you know. So then that yeah. way we can, yeah. That's gonna be a good I, one. I agree. It's okay. We can still eat rice and eggs before the race together. Nice. That's right. There we go. That's going to make it way better. Then It'll I won't be, be getting mocked by Sophia the whole time for eating rice and eggs. She was vicious for no reason on that. So, oh, man. Um, Brutal. yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. She's not, she's not okay with me eating rice and eggs. She let me know. So, uh, anyways, that's all I eat. She's probably just like, you guys are all just crazy. <laughs> <laughs> it's so yeah, good. Yeah. I, honestly, it is. What's wrong with rice like, and eggs? Yeah, the I fastest people I know eat rice and eggs and a ton of cereal. Like that's, it's, you know, so if you eat rice and eggs and a lot of cereal, you'll be fast. Ergo. Mm -hmm. so. Sorry to do another quick aside, but like mm -hmm. healing, I had so many bad nutrition, like eating disorder, people giving me bad advice for so many years about like bad calories and just like junk mm -hmm. weight, like food that's wasteful to eat. And then Keen, you said Keegan eats cereal. And I was like, Oh my God, are you serious? And I got so excited <laughs> and I now buy cereal regularly for the first time in, I'm not kidding, like a good decade. I'm so happy and excited. So thank you, Keegan. <laughs> the game changer. I eat <laughs> honeycomb <laughs> now. <laughs> I love it. I'm yeah, so that's how it should be. Yeah. yeah. We got to do a tour of our cereal cabinets. That's that's next up on the Trainer Road podcast. Cereal yeah, check. that'd be good. Yeah. <laughs> I one time thought I was like, dude, I found churro cereal. This is amazing. I'm going to send a picture to Keegan about it. Like he's going to, he's going to be so gonna stoked. He was like, yeah. already in his trash can. <laughs> yeah. He was like, yeah, I eat that all the time. <laughs> Old news. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. If anybody has fringe cereal. Find at Costco. 
Yeah. If anybody has fringe cereal, post it on Instagram and tag trainer road and Keegan. And let's see if we can find something that he hasn't had. Uh, that'll be a, that'll be a good contest. So, uh, thanks for joining us y'all uh, go follow Keegan, Alex and Ivy and myself on Instagram. Just search our names. You'll find us on there. <clears throat> follow trainer road, go to trainer road, use plan builder and have the best season yet. Adaptive training is incredible. Like if you heard the Kona podcast, all those athletes said it was an absolute game changer for them. And it's the same thing across the board. It's huge. It's awesome. We have workout levels V2 coming out, AI FTP detection coming out, all fantastic stuff. So stay tuned to our YouTube channel. Stay tuned to our podcast channels. Rate the podcast and Spotify. We'll talk to you next week. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Good old.